<laughs> yeah, stop it, stop it, stop it. I don't even <laughs> want to know your list. <laughs> Tell me this Negro is an honorable mention right now. <laughs> no, yeah, it's honorable mention. Honorable oh, mention. thank God, Jesus. It Welcome back to the Millennial Classics, y'all, with yours truly, Q and Burry. On this podcast, we talk about the best and most memorable movies, music, and culture-changing events from our generation. This is the second time we do this, but this time we're doing it right. We are talking future classics. Well, Burry, how you been and how excited are you to talk about 2023? I've been good, and uh, this has been an honestly great year for big movies i feel like a lot of surprises came out this year it's still like the winter break so i'm still catching up on like the the oscar movies the one i probably am most excited about holdovers ditto i feel like we've seen enough movies to to make a solid list holdovers probably would have gotten on this list some of the other ones like zone of interest the bernstein movie maestro i just i I feel like that would have been played out and then some of the movies that i thought were really hot this year my biggest disappointment, Napoleon. Yeah, that's uh, nowhere close to the list. The one thing I do disagree with you is I disagree on the fact that it was a big year for big movies. In fact, I thought it was a shitty year for some of the biggest movies. The Indiana Joneses, Aquaman, all of these superhero nostalgia plays, all of these movies were kind of a letdown this year. Well, So that's yeah. why I disagree with you in saying it was a big year for the big movies. There were a couple of big movies that were insane. Barbara Timer, those two together. Those big movies did very, very big. But the reason they stand out so much is because what all the other usual big movies, the Marvels, um, Ant-Man, Quantumania, those movies shit. So everyone was talking about the movies that did well. Oh my God! You, you know what I mean? Essentially what you're saying is a terrible year for super, superhero movies. Exactly. And honestly, thank God. We've been waiting for it. It's, <laughs> it's been, I'm, honestly, because I was one of those guys that's like, I've seen every Marvel movie that came out. But Thor 4 was the one where I was like, this is this insane. should be a slam dunk and it's yeah. actually not good. And then and then Ant Man oh was Quantum the last Radiant? one where I was oh like, Oh my god, that dude with the big feels head? like they did this shit during COVID. This yeah. feels like <laughs> everyone zoomed in to this shit. And I was like, all right, all right. So maybe Marvel's really choking here. It didn't help that Kang the Conqueror is Kang the, the woman beater. Uh, all of that started kind of uh, compounded. The Marvel kind of faltered, and then we already knew the state of DC, you know. So, yeah. and it, it <laughs> the way you talk about Blue Beetle it makes me feel bad. <laughs> The Blue Beetle, yeah. there's no chance I'm going to watch that movie. Of course not. Of I'm course not going to watch Aquaman. I have a full list of movies on this list that I, I have under still need to see. Because we are talking about the best movies of 2023. You guys, let's get into the podcast. This is the future classics. These are the movies we think 10 years from now we're going to look back at. And we're going to be yeah. doing millennial classic podcasts on the movies on this list. That is indeed the hope, right? Who knows what the future will hold. But the hope is we have the insight. We have the the vibe check right so mm-hmm. let's start off with 10 through 6 and let's fly through these mumbury let's you yep. go back and forth like a, like a quick tennis match talk to me about your 10 through 6 you go with 10 seven. was honestly the hardest because i got a lot of honorable mentions mm-hmm. 10 i'm gonna go through for the surprise of the year dungeons and dragons i have i have 10 as my number five my number six so that would have been 11 it would have been t te- um the teenage mutant t- ninja turtles but my number 10 is dnd what madness is this yeah and I, only and, watched, and I i only watched it because you told me about it when we did our list halfway through the year it is so fun like if this movie had no dungeon and dragons thing and it was just literally just like mythical movie Heist? i feel yeah. like pe- people would have just been like this is a great movie like all this <laughs> shit but now that it's dungeons and dragons and like dice fuck those and nerds all this bullshit yeah <laughs> that's the thing but yeah chris pine is he's, he's like the guy that you're like this dude should be super famous he's so charismatic it's weird that he's he not. has a star war he starts the star trek yeah and it's like that's it i'm the best chris and he's a beautiful man. Like, he looks like a superstar. Um, Chris Pratt gets a lot of roles. Unnecessary. Like, yeah, it's weird. Like, it Chris really is. Pine, who's your agent? You know, it's, it's <laughs> another one of those, who's your agent? Dungeons and Dragons is the type of movie that you wish they just made five over a year. Yeah. And uh, we all just went to go see him. So, yeah, that's my number 10. What's your number 10? Oh, That's also my it? number 10, so I'm going to jump to num- my number 9. It is cheating, but it was just like the action movies of my year was John Wick and the Mission Impossible. Okay, let's not talk about Mission Impossible now, but let's talk about John Wick. Ready, John? Yeah. 
I don't know if I was talking to you about this, but uh, John Wick is basically a superhero. He's yeah, in the, it's the best superhero movie of the year. In that movie, I started to get frustrated at like, this is just silly. The man has killed a thousand people in chapter four alone. Forget about the three previous movies. If it, you're just trying it, to turn your brain off and watch something exciting, you turn on John it's, Wick. It's such a fun movie to watch, but when you start thinking about it, like the first couple movies, at least it was they were kind of straightforward. Yeah, John Wick Four got to the point where I was like, "Why do they follow rules so much when this guy can literally kill everyone on on the planet? Like they are super into rules. Like you, like you flip <laughs> cards and you have to kill with this blade and and meet at this time yeah. and meet on this hill. Yeah, and I'm like." But it's John Wick. It's John Wick. This dude Wick. has proven I know. time and time again that he could literally kill anybody on the planet. <laughs> Who is this high table? Why do they hang out in the in this Arabian desert? <laughs> that seems so impractical. In the worst he hangs out with the cushions in Dubai. <laughs> I, I just don't get what's going on. Thousand degrees outside. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make I, sense. I, my nine, Anatomy of a Fall. Okay, let's not talk about that right now. Okay, it's on and my it's on my top five. My number eight is Barbie. Okay, that's my number seven. So good for you. Great movie. It's just I think when I saw it, it was probably like a top five, and then it's just slipped further and further back. Fun movie. They, I mean, she Greta Gerwig did way more than I ever expected for a Barbie 100%. movie. Acting is great. I don't know how many awards are going to win. If anyone is going to win something, I guess it would be Ryan Gosling or Greta. Stuff. So I'm not worried about it. Not now, Margaret. Let's shake on this. We are going to make a lot. But Oppenheimer just seems like it's it's going to win everything. But, but but what you're saying about Barbie. It was a good time. Like, it really, it was a good time and in the theater. a phenomenon. And exactly. And that's the thing. It, 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 for those folks who've been with us for a bit, that's the only movie that I went out to talk to the people. People were dressed up for the movie. People were excited. People were going to see a double feature, both of which would take like a six-hour length of your day. It was right. It was an event. I'm just going to cheat here. My number six was Oppenheimer. My number uh, seven was Barb. So... I kind of had Barbenheimer, okay. those two. Yeah. I'm just, um, you just skipped my eight. Yeah. Talk about your eight. My eight is the boy in the heron. Her uh, you, boy in the heron. heron. I haven't um, that seen was it yet. Miyazaki. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. You guys know I love my anime. You see my One Piece reactions. He he deserves all the credit in the world. It, yes. He knows how to tell a story through animation that means so much with animation that makes you, it, it's just, it's it's a very beautiful watch and a good story to boot. Okay. And then what to number seven? Told you seven was Barbie. Six was Oppenheimer. Okay. So we won't talk about, let's not talk about Oppenheimer yet. My seven was Spider-Verse. Oh, wow. Okay. Are you even cooler under your mask? Oh, this cool the whole time. Um, Let's not talk um, about Spider Verse. Okay, and then my six was the killer. The killer. The killer. David Fincher, Michael I Fassbender. Oh, it this is the Netflix. Netflix. Everyone's talking about this movie. Yeah. Never yield an advantage. Okay. Um, it's on Netflix. David Fincher is probably my favorite director. No, nah, this is not my favorite David Fincher movie. It's probably not even my favorite Michael Fassbender movie, but this movie is so well made. It's actually really funny. The it's funny, scenes, like comedy, yeah, uh, like in a, in like a in like a pay attention kind of way. It's funny. Oh, okay, I don't know what that um, means, but I'll give it a shot. The action is crazy good. There's a couple action scenes where it's up there with the scenes of the year. Like, honestly, if we're talking best scenes of the year, it'd be in my top three. Best action scenes of the year, this movie has it. Just so well made. It just it flies by. And that you can't, you honestly can't say that about a lot of movies this year. There's a lot of movies where even as good as they are, looking at you, Killers of the Flower Moon, you just keep looking at your fucking watch. Right. So to say that the, killers fly, the killer flies by, Great. What's your number six? I told you, Barbie and Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Six and seven. Okay. I'm ready yeah, to get so, into the meats. I'm ready okay, to get into the meats. Okay, let's get into the meats. meats and I guarantee you this movie is not in your top five. Um, It's not in your top ten. I hope it's in your honorable mention, and I hope you've seen it. 
The Burial. Have you yeah, seen I don't, it? I, I don't, haven't even heard of this movie. So <laughs> I didn't even hear, <laughs> I like, didn't even hear about you. it. Too. Like, what are you talking about? Talk to me about this movie. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> when you hear about this movie, you'll be like, how the fuck haven't I heard about this? I'm a sucker for courtroom dramas. I think I've seen almost every single one. Like, all the way back, go back, black and white. I've, I've, I've watched them all. Love courtroom dramas. I just love how contained they are. I have this above Anatomy of Fall because it's way lighter, way more enjoyable courtroom drama. It stars Jamie Foxx, Tommy Lee Jones, Journey Smollett. <laughs> and it's based on a true story. Tommy Lee Jones is like, he owns a couple funeral homes and he's being bought out by like someone who calls himself like the king of death. He like, he's trying to buy out all the funeral homes in America so that he can just make jack up prices and win a ton of money. You're a fighter, man. What made you want to do it? Because he tried to mess with the one thing that means the most to me in life, being able to leave something behind for my grandchildren. And Jamie Foxx comes in, you know, he's got his accent, and he just fucking kills it. It's such a fun movie. It's on Amazon Prime. Anyone can see it. It came out in October. And it's just one of those movies where it's like, yo, Thanksgiving, like with your family, you, you would play this movie. It's like there's no issues. There's no, like, sex scenes or anything like that. You just play this movie, enjoy it with your family. Everyone's happy. Based it, everyone loves the based on a true story thing, too. Is it based uh, on a true story? Yeah, it is. Okay. But he's, like, one of those He's one of those lawyers with, like, gold rings and got a plane. Honestly, Wait, who's just, playing the lawyer? Who's Jamie, Jamie Fox? Fox? He's Jamie Fox. playing the lawyer? Like, from Jacksonville. Are you, uh, telling, honestly, me, are you telling me I'm supposed to? Like, is this one of those? You remember when Denzel did The Esquire? Is it something like that, or is it Roman J. Israel Esquire? There you um, go. Uh, no, no, it's not like me. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not like that. It's the type of movie Wait, where give me, give it's me super... something you could compare it to, because I like I have like I can't even imagine it. Jamie Foxx is a lawyer. It's like it's like if Air was about lawyers. That's the vibe. Oh, okay. Chill. Oh, okay. Chill. I see it's what like you if mean. If Air was about lawyers, gotcha. I can the that, stuff at stake, but at the end of the day, it's, it's made like, so breezy and like nonchalantly that you just you just keep going with it, and everyone just kills it. So that that's my number five. I just wanted to give it a quick shout out because it's probably not in a lot of top tens, yeah. but it's one of those movies where it's on Amazon Prime. Anyone can go watch it. Maybe don't watch Jack Reacher for the fifth time and give this movie <laughs> give this movie <laughs> a watch. Yeah, right, Prime your, Video is five? weird, right? I, I feel Yo, like Prime Video is wild. The weird, oh, it's the weirdest <laughs> streaming service, bro. What the hell? Oh my god. god. I get so confused when I'm on there. I, I hate when it's like, oh, yo, do you want to watch fucking Mission Possible? Yeah, Pay I do. $60. It's $16.99. What are you talking about? <laughs> I thought I paid for this. What's going on here? It sounds like I'm going to be the voice of the people. Uh, I know we were talking shit about superhero movies, but I have to do this. And um, when we're talking about the entire year of 2023, because the expectation and the process through the year was so shitty when it came to superhero movies, Movies. I have to give credit where credit is due and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I just oh had God. such a good time. Don't, don't give me your shit. shit. I don't, don't want to hear the side. Like... You would talk about Jamie Foxx a second ago, okay? I'm just telling you, I felt so much more than I expected to feel. Mo that's the main reason it's on this Dude, list. I and... teared up at the, at the finale, at the song. Yes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying, bro. Like, it, 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 it did what it's supposed to do. It was a superhero movie the way we like them. It told the story of of a character we believed and trusted and loved in a year that everyone was talking about the death of superhero movies. I can't give it enough credit. I enjoyed it so much. We've talked about this when we redid our Guardians of the Galaxy, so I don't have to explain this to anyone, but um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was my number five. Pete, I'm done running. Talk to me about number four. Honestly, I, we, let's talk a bit more about Guardians of the Galaxy because it's, oh, it, was in my, it, it was in my honorable mentions. What? I love this movie. Yes. Best superhero movie of the year. It came as kind of like a weird thing because James Gunn was famously fired from Marvel. He was rehired, but in that interval, DC hired him. He's now in charge of the DC Cinematic Universe, the new step uh, moving forward. So it's a weird thing where he's in charge of the competition, but of course, he's like the steward of the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. So they had him back. Most successful of, I think, the, the last phase of movies. And they made Rocket Raccoon the, exactly. the, the focal point of the movie. And it's it's something you didn't see coming. And it works so well. Bradley Cooper kills it. And it's a it's an animal <laughs> it's an animal rights movie. 
I learned about Florence and the Machines. I didn't yep. even know who they were until that movie. And then now I'm like, yo, I that song became my, one of my most played songs in my in my 2023 replay. There you go. Like you know, like it's not as serious as like maybe like a Dark Knight or like a Joker. Yeah. But it does all the right things. We did the Guardians Volume One as a millennial classic this year. Please go watch that if you if you care about the con like the whole the, the series. But if you go back and watch Guardians One. You see it all put together. He thinks I'm some stupid thing. He does. Well, I didn't ask to get made. I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together over and over. But prior to walking into the movie theater to watch Guardians 3, you had like, obviously, if you saw the trailers, you understand it's about Rocket Raccoon. But if you go in there, you're like, this movie is about Rocket Raccoon. And then you just think about it for a hot second and you're like, oh my goodness, he's been doing this from day one, from the get of the entire series. Rocket Raccoon has been basically like, um, if uh, Chris Pratt is A1, if uh, Star-Lord is A1, um, Rocket Raccoon was his like right-hand man. And it, right. they did it so well. The name's Rocket. Rocket Raccoon. Um, Burry, what's your number four? My number four is Mission Possible. Dead okay. Reckoning. I need you this to explain movie this to is me. So fucking well made. It feels like you they spent two hundred million dollars on it. There's another movie that came out this year that also spans the globe. It's called Fast X. I don't have friends. I got family. <laughs> it also is, is supposed to take place in Rome. None of the characters actually end up being in Rome. Bruh. They film it in green screens and shit, and then they just they send a camera crew to Rome to film exterior shots, but. None of them are in Rome. And they drop a nuke rolling down the road. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it honestly feels like you you wasted your money because that's what you pay. You pay to see Rome blown up in real life. Yeah. This movie, Tom Cruise is actually driving a BMW with no doors through Rome. They're driving a, a Fiat 500 down the Spanish steps. Yeah. That happens. They, these guys, they're in Dubai. They're in the desert. They're in Venice. And it's one of those things where this movie probably came out five six times a year in the 90s you know harrison ford had an action movie where the world was at stake john claude van damme had a movie arnold Schwarzenegger had a movie even john wick 4 which is an amazing action movie there's nothing at stake it's john wick's life i mean exactly. and a hotel in new york who yep. gives a shit yep this movie it's like the fate of the world is at stake it's very of our time Yep. The bad guy is AI. Chat GPT. I mean, Chat GPT. You know, Bing, bitch. That's the bad <laughs> guy. You know, it. This is the that's like it. It's it's like thumb right on the issue. Yeah. Tom Cruise is amazing in this. Yes. Hilly Atwell's amazing in this. Rebecca Ferguson always amazing. First ten minutes doesn't even have Tom Cruise. No. <laughs> A yeah. sub blown out. Exactly. Riveting. It's in your it's fucking actually you don't intense, even know what's bro. going on. It's a fucking Cuban Missile Crisis. But <laughs> I would actually, watch that movie. Right? I would watch that movie. And then it just cuts to the FBI and they're worrying like worrying about this and that and like all the classic Mission Impossible gags. It's funny. Seven, six, five. Oh, 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 oh. You know, Simon Pegg, Ving Rames. They keep it light. It it has all these 90s gags where, like, you know, the bad guys fuck up. They're, they're arresting the wrong guys in the Dubai airport. It's just such a good time, and it still feels grounded that, I don't know, it's just... How did you... Let me ask, how, how did you feel about this being a part one of two? Did you think uh, it was necessary? Liked, did you like the ending? I think that if they hadn't called it part one, but I think people would have been like, cool, okay. Yeah. That was a story in its, in and of itself. 100%. Right? The bad guy, I probably would have gotten a little bit more of a heavy, heavy hitter, but Isai Morales was still pretty good. Yeah. They do that classic like soap opera trick of, yeah, we're going to talk about some guy we've never mentioned before in seven movies that's suddenly pivotal to fucking Ethan Hunt's backstory. <laughs> what, was that, the, what was that James Bond movie that the last fight was on the ice? You yeah, know what I'm talking about? Even, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie. <laughs> oh my God. I still haven't rewatched it. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. It's like, oh, he's a ghost. No one knows. Yeah. Oh, for real. But he's everyone from my knows past. him. It's he's like, dog, ghost. you have three friends. You don't talk about him at all. He's a uh, ghost but... that everyone knows. Everybody knows him. First name basis. Yeah. But honestly, it, this is the type of movie where it's like on execution alone, everyone does the right thing. Like the, the score is good. The act is good. Cinematography is great. On, on all that alone, it has to be top five. This is the one casualty of the Barbenheimer came out a week after both yeah. of those movies and it just got 
buried, but 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, it's really people good. People love this movie. It just got buried. And I think this, this out of all of these movies, is a movie where it's like, in five years, people are going to be like, yo, Dead Reckoning Part 1. Really Epic. fucking good. Because Can I just tell you? Can I just tell you? The scene where they're going from one train car to the next as it falls off the cliff. Bro, I'm like legitimately holding my breath, like holy shit! You know, you know they're gonna save the day, but he's like, right. "You gotta jump right now." The piano drops. I'm like, right. and oh. Haley Atwell, yo, right? Yeah, Jesus, <laughs> yeah, that's talent. That's <laughs> talent. Hi, hello, mommy. It's, um, it's so good. What's your number four? I think we are going to have a conversation about the epic drama of the year. But my number four is Killers of the Flower Moon. That's my number three. So let's let's just bang it out right now. Oh, perfect. Killers of the Flower Moon. This is uh, Martin Scorsese, Leonardo DiCaprio. And what's her name? Um, Lily Gladstone. Lily Gladstone. You know, you think of the Vikings like raping and pillaging folk. This is like the Machiavellian, like most torturous, Slow way. grossest way of killing a people in the history yeah. of the world and it's so hard to watch the entire time the entire time i'm screaming at the screen why are you doing this why are you marrying this dude did you not see what the fuck happened to your brother i mean to your sister like a week ago but it's like the most tense the most insane and then like just just the fact that it happened the fact that it happened blows your mind and what and no Scorsese, one knows about it exactly and what Martin Scorsese does at the end of the movie where he comes out and it's this dude speaking like you just watched a play makes you think about what's going on in such a fucking like fourth wall breaking insane. Yeah. She was a full blood Osage. She was buried in the old cemetery in Grey Horse. There was no mention of the murders. It makes you think so much. You can't, like, I've thought about this movie more times than I think I've thought about many movies. And this is just a personal thing. I'll stop my rant. I'm in Colorado right now. In the movie, Lily Gladstone is telling Ernest Leonardo DiCaprio at the, towards the end when shit is really fucking breaking down. Let's move to Denver. I know so many people, Denver natives, um, Colorado natives here that say with so much pride in their chest, I'm one eighth Native American. I'm one fourth Native American. But I I don't think people know what the fuck that means. It's insane. Just the, the history of this situation, the reality of the situation, but the acting to make you feel it is so deep and it's so and it's done so well. I don't know if this is going to win more awards than Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer did so much more money. It was such a bigger movie, but we'll see what happens. It was made with just as much care. Yes. It's one of those movies yes. where POV matters because the standard thing to do, which is, this is honestly one of the bone to picks I have with a lot of slave movies, is you make it from the POV of the, <laughs> the slave. <laughs> yeah. So then you, you're you constantly thinking, like, from the victim point of view as a victim. But here's the, th the crazy thing about this movie is it's from Ernest's point of view. And it's Leo. The most, one of the most charismatic actors of all time. So even when he's at his shittiest, you're like, Leo, come on, man. Like, hey, come turn on. it around. Yeah. Come on, that's your wife. Come on. Shomikasi. That's how you are. I don't know what she said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> you love her though, right? You love her a little bit, right? And like... Even when he's poisoning her to death and he's crying, a little part of you is like, this dude, the biggest piece of shit. But honestly, I kind of feel a little bad for him. But that's the beauty of this movie because then you realize like, this is this is what actually happened. These are the type of people that destroy nations, destroy civil cultures because it's like, yeah, he just couldn't step up. And because of that, she, she almost time. died. Mumbori, I love doing these with you because... That's such a good point, right? Every slave movie is from the slaver's point of view, right? You don't even think about that. But POV is, it, it's it, it's everything. It's fucking everything, right? right? And, and it's so smart. But at the same time, the reason I felt bad for Ernest, I, and I have to just say it, the dude's dumb. That's very plainly clear when he's exactly. being taken advantage of. It's supposed to be a suicide, you dumb bell. You didn't tell him to leave the gun. I don't I know why I told him to leave the gun. I told, I told him, exactly. him to leave the gun. Just like you what told him, kid. I don't know why he didn't. I don't know why. And, and like the entire movie, he keeps saying this statement, you know, I'm not thick. Are you thick? I'm not thick. I'm like, you're the thickest of all of them. You dumb motherfucker. And it's one of those things where it's like, when the FBI shows up and... <laughs> 
figures out the entire operation in about 10 minutes yeah. and you're like, where were you guys? That's the kind of reaction we all have when something bad happens to everyone's, you know, there's riots here, there's riots there. And you're like, oh, there's corrupt, like, like Ferguson, it's like the DOJ did an investigation. The Ferguson police department is one of the most corrupt police departments in the country. It's like, all right, cool. But where were you guys? Like, where were the feds this entire time? Like, that must have been plainly obvious. We didn't need someone to choke to death on the sidewalk. This, these people just get away with it for so long because no one gives a shit. No one gives a Osage shit. About Indians. No and, one gives a shit about black people in Ferguson, Missouri. No one gives a shit about all these people until it's on the limelight. Exactly. Then it becomes, Bad, oh. it's, it becomes an embarrassing thing. But these people were literally drained of all their wealth systematically and in a legal way, which is honestly the craziest part yeah. because they were literally told they can't handle their money, but it was such obscene wealth. It's like, it's like, it's almost like, could you imagine this happening in like Saudi Arabia oh, yeah. where they no, just went insane. to the sheiks and they were just like, yeah, you guys, I mean, the oil's yours. Well, you know, I, really. I, I kept on thinking of like, what's the thing that Britney Spears was in with her father? Like yeah, a, conservatorship. conservatorship, yeah. So that's basically what all of these uh, the Osage Nation folks were under, which was insane. The entire movie, like in the beginning of that movie, where Lily Gladstone is asking the banker for some money, and the banker is like, "You pay three hundred dollars for some meat at the grocery mart," and in that's the beginning of the movie. I was like, "Of course, Lily's lying. She's just asked saying that this happened so she can get more money and use the money the way she wants." But you find out very quickly. These are the prices that they're giving the Osage Nation in that county just because they have that kind of money. And they're right. just sucking the money out of these people like like in plain, blatant daylight. And it right. just happened. Yeah, it, when like, Ernest is like, you charging me Osage prices? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, funniest part of the movie. He's like, come on, man. I'm trying to get a coffee. You charging me Osage prices? Come on. <laughs> I'm like, yo, Ernest, you roll with the Osage, you roll with the Osage, bro. <laughs> Amazing movie. And then yeah. even, yeah, the self-awareness at the end uh, to just be like, yeah, this isn't a story that I should have been telling. I'm not the one who should tell this story, but but to be honest, it's not, to it. yeah. it's not getting made unless I tell it. So that's so why I did it. Done. My number three is past lives. Right, that's my number two. Oh, fantastic. There's a word in Korean, inyon. It means providence or fate. The concept, the theme, the idea of the movie is what if I did that? What would my life look like? Right. And like, there's no human being that doesn't think about that. If not at a weekly basis, at a daily basis, like what if I did that? If I did that and it's not, and it's not regret in the, the hardshipness of it. It's like the simple decision of what if I just continue to talk to this dude. Childhood sweethearts who reconnect 20 years later and realize they were meant for each other. In the story, I would be the evil white American husband standing in the way of destiny. Shut up. I don't know right. the names, please. I, I tried to find the, 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 the actors' names for this movie. This is a foreign film, and it's about... The story unfolds over 24 years, focusing on Nora and Hei Sung, deeply connected childhood friends separated by I uh, immigration. Basically, they reconnect. The uh, love that they had for each other was so deep that it spanned 24 years of not seeing each other in person. And then they finally see each other in person, but Nora is now married, and... Just the adultness, the the respect given to every one of the characters, including Nora's wife and Nora's wife, Nora's husband in the movie, is so beautifully done. It's simple. The movie's so simple, but it it, it means so much. It means so yeah, much. Yeah, they talk about this thing called in yun, mm, which is just yeah. like Korean thing about like fate, kind of, and who you're supposed to be with, and when you when you meet someone kind of like that, it means that you've met them in your past lives, which is where the title comes from. And even beyond all that, it's just, it's one of those things where there's certain moments in your life where you meet people and it's like, oh yeah, I have a connection with this person. Yes. And then either it continues or you split off and then you just think about that that divergence in time. And that's what this movie is about. It's like these guys split up when they were 12. And for some reason, I can't even imagine having such a connection like that where 12 years later, you're like, I'm just going to, we're going to start talking over 
over Skype and we're not going to stop for a couple months all the time we're talking because that's a that's a crazy connection and then splitting up and then doing that again, again. 24 years later yeah. which is this the crux which is the whole movie it's very A24 if you know what I'm oh, talking 100%. about this is like quintessential A24 like you're staring at a puddle for three seconds while the movie <laughs> 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 the music's going out <laughs> in the background. And you're like, all right, cool. A24, back at it. <laughs> no, back but at I, it. I but do have this. It, I, it, yes. It add to it. Like, there's a scene where uh, Nora Gretel meets San Magaro. They do, like, a lot of shots, but there's a shot where it's silhouetted in the dark. And you can see them, too, like, on the hill with some trees. And... It's just all black because it's silhouetted and in, in, in the sunset and they're just walking around and talking to each other and you can see their connection and you're like, all right, sick shot. But it goes on for like a minute. It's and then, yes. Uh, honestly, it's just one of those things where it's like, all right, like it's one of those things, but it sits in those moments and it makes, honestly, it adds to the movie because it's like, these are the moments you remember. Exactly. Like, but then, very weirdly, when when Hey Sung shows up in in New York, and he's like, "Yeah, I mean, we met at the fucking riders retreat. We <laughs> fucked. We 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 got together. We moved back in to save some money on rent. There, we married yeah. each other for like it's just just such a big juxtaposition between you know these grand gestures of love and fate that that we think about, and then the reality of life. Of what you and, remember, and the what thing you, that means. And the actual things that actually happen in your life. Yeah. You know, like, I'm, I'm married from a green card, but all my life I thought Prince, Prince fucking Charming was going to sweep me off my feet. Yep. Are you attracted to him? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. When, you, when they're together, you're like, yo, they look like such a good couple, but... But that's not that's not that's not what it was meant to be. But such a great movie. On the flip side of that scene is the scene where uh, Nora and Hei Sung and they splitting up. Nora w walks upstairs and Hei Sung yeah. continues to walk straight. When they're that's kids. Yeah, when they're kids. And like uh, like when you said that they spent a little bit too much time with Nora and her husband when they first met, I thought that was perfectly set. That was perfectly done because that prior to you seeing the backs of them and them separating, the entire time of them walking, they know that this is the last time that they're going to see each other and they're quiet and they don't talk to each other. So it builds the tension. And then they literally say one or two words to each other and then separate. And you do want to sit in that. You do understand what that thing is. Is. Like, I don't know if it's because I'm an immigrant, but like, I think it's just universal. When you separate from a friend, from a connection, from a relationship, and especially when you know, factually, this is the last time I'm going to see you at least for a very long time, if not forever. That is such a, like a deep, deep, deep moment. And they play it so well. Yeah. So and, well. And it's not even that they're just separating. It's like, she's quite literally moving on up. Yeah. And he's staying at the same place. Like she's exactly. climbing the staircase and moving on up to Canada. And he's like, well, fuck, I'm just stuck here. And even when he's talking with his buddies, and his buddy's like, yeah, I'm fucking failing in this class. And he has to go to China to learn Chinese for some prospects. And she's like, I'm doing plays and I'm trying to win Oscars and stuff and Tonys and Nobel Prizes. They, I think they're going to win a lot of independent awards, but yeah. it's just, it's a tough year. Because my number one is what's going to win a lot of awards, but we got to talk about your number two. My number two is Spider Man Across the Spider Verse. You guys, I love this! Miles Morales came through and in such a big fucking way. I was talking to you about the boy in uh, Heron earlier in my uh, runners up or my, it was like number eight or something. Disney has forced animation to become this like 3D CGI thing that everyone has been obsessed with, right? And then Miyazaki comes out and he does his 2D hand-drawn insanity, right? Like the, just the greatness that he's always been doing for, for since he came onto the stage. Your mother, she's awaiting your rescue. I'll be your guide. And then Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse, you think, you think, you think. They've done every form of animation. I've seen a million animated movies in my life. And it's so different and so good. It's so good that um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles crew decided to do the same type of animation. And it succeeded in that movie. <laughs> Thank you. 
But this is the follow-up to the first Into the Spider-Verse more than the animation, more than the fact that it builds on the story of the Into the Spider-Verse so well. I felt for Miles Morales. It looks so beautiful. The, the idea that they're talking about is he's part of a multiverse. And that's the thing. The entire phase four of Marvel's doing this multiverse, the DC trying to do the multiverse with the Flash that bombed and was shitty as hell. This is how you do a multiverse movie, a story, right? It's about the person. And then, yes, he gets to experience other Spider-Mans and you can tell how good it is. I have to say the Spider-Man movie with Tom Holland, kind of close, but that movie felt like here's all, what's the word? Easter eggs. It was like Easter egg shit through, thrown on the, on the screen. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. After watching this movie, like a week later, I rewatched it. Mumbury, I know you made the list, and uh, please watch Mumbury's list of the best Spider-Man movies of all time. And he does list this, and I think you have this at number two. Am I right? Or is it uh, number three? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's it was like two. three or uh, number two. Three, or, three or two. Yeah. I'm telling you, Mumbury. I am telling you. This made me question if it was better than Spider-Man Two. Spider-Man Two is still my number one. I'm not gonna lie to you, but it really came close, and that's the the reason I needed it in my top five. It is my number two on this list because holy fuck I had such a good time I like you pause the movie wherever you want and you can have that as any wallpaper for anything well this is what I'll say because this is my number 10 and I'll say two things one is spot the villain is so <laughs> well done I've never heard of him and they make it to make it to the Miles Morales' journey, learning with Spot is exactly your journey watching a movie because yes. you're like, who the fuck is this guy? In? And he <laughs> treats him like a dog shit D-list fucking bad guy in the beginning of the movie, just like you would. I created you. You created me. What a man, what did you create that guy? And this guy is for legit. And I love how they do that. Movie is so well made, so well crafted. It's beautiful. They make Gwen the starter for the first 20 minutes of the movie. And the artwork is different. The palette's different. Yeah. And you really get a sense of Gwen's life. I mean, they do such a good job. Honestly, if we're talking about, like, craft, this movie's a top five movie. Yeah. The only thing that I have that put it in number 10. Talk about the ending. I know. I is know. the fucking ending. Yep. You want in? And of course, it's one of those endings where it's not the worst ending of the year. That goes to Fast 10 with Vin <laughs> Diesel and his child at the bottom of a dam that's about to explode. <laughs> and they, honestly, that movie ends like a dog shit, like 70s <laughs> TV show. <laughs> yeah. But, like it, all it's missing is the dot, 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 dot. Yeah. Like, that's all it's missing. The, but but this movie is like part one, and it's not like a part one where you feel satisfied. It's a part one where it's like I'm I'm actively here waiting for more, and I know that this is going to take them three years at best. So that's I why mean, it's my number ten. Yeah. But honestly, if they could figure out a way to end this movie well, and it wasn't an issue. I thought this movie would probably be my top five. It'd probably I'd probably switch. Can I try to defend this ending, Mumbury? You just what's it, what's you it? just told me five minutes ago that Tom Cruise jumping out of a fucking a blown up train with a parachute is a decent ending to a part one. And now you're telling me that Miles Morales jumping off of a train heading to like space and then seeing his 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 bad version self is a bad ending to a movie? No, to no, a no, part no, one? no, no, no. One ends in a cliffhanger and one ends with like. Oh, more is to more come. Is, okay, but I, like, oh, yeah, you're right. But okay. like, we've yeah, wrapped okay. this up. Tom Cruise has saved the day. Like yeah. he's completed he's the that key. arc. Yeah, he's done right. the job. Yeah, you're right. right. You're right. He's completed that arc. It's just like there's obviously there's a second part. Yeah. They could have just called it Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning, and everyone would have been like, "Oh yeah, we're waiting for the sequel." But gotcha. but like Tom Cruise finished the job. Mumbo, before you tell me about your number one, do you want to tell me your honorable mentions? Yeah, I'm going to talk about my honorable mentions, and then but before we talk about that. We're going to talk about one movie that I haven't had a chance to see. I missed it while it was in theaters, and now I'm, like, scrambling and trying to find a way to watch it. But it, it's a movie that I think would have gone in my top ten. And the movie's called Godzilla. Minus this one. New, minus one. And 
it's one of those movies where I just I feel like I'm missing out because yeah. I feel like I would have loved this movie. The the Godzilla I think it came on 2013 with Walter White for Breaking Bad, mm-hmm. and the first 15 minutes of that movie <laughs> is so good. <laughs> That you're like, you know, give me that movie. Like the rest of our movie is mid, but the first 15 minutes when they're showing kind of like, you know, the feet of the monster and the Breaking Bad dude is acting his ass off. And you're like, <laughs> this movie is amazing. And it's before we get to like the let them fight and yeah. bullshit. I mean, that shit, shit's still sick, but that movie, from what I've heard, I would really like. But moving on to my honorable mentions, um, I got Air, the mm-hmm. Michael Jordan story. Yep. Milo Davis kills it. Matt Damon's always dope. Epitome of consistency. Yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy 3. You Good talked about it. You mm-hmm. don't really have to talk about it. My guy right here, Equalizer 3. Yes. I was Denzel, waiting for you to bring him up. I, I was hoping he was the number Robert one. Robert <laughs> McCall. Oh my God. This movie has no business being such a fun movie. I think if you have a parent between the ages of 50 and 70, do them a favor. Just just do them a favor. Buy them the three equalized movie and just let them relax. All right? Give them a weekend. They will fucking love it. All right? I mean, this is a dude that like solves people's debt issues when they're in old age. That Like that's his life goal. I mean, that's if amazing. he doesn't resonate with them, that's amazing. He's a Lyft driver. I mean, I, I heard that. Denzel one, brings the coda from Man on Fire in this yeah, movie. This it, movie is it great. Place, it's great. It, Nine seconds. The Blackberry movie. This movie kind of went under the radar in the beginning, but it is one of those solid movies that can probably watch whenever. You think I won't fucking do it? I'm from Waterloo, where the vampires hang out! Like, it's not a movie you gotta watch in 2023, but whenever you watch it, you'll say that's a good, it's a well-made movie. Jay Burrishell's amazing. The story of Blackberry is one of those things where you kind of had to be there to know how popular they were. I remember when I was a senior in high school, there was this girl that literally was like, I'm trying to get a Blackberry because I want to go on BBM. And that was Blackberry Messenger. And, and, and like, like, like that, that was, was the, the hot, hot shit, shit at the time. time. Like, like, like that was what was going on. Do they talk about the downfall or is it just yeah, the because they talk the, about the downfall? Okay, okay. They talk about the downfall. And they talk about they literally show the iPhone reveal oh, shit. and the execs watching the iPhone reveal. It's it's honestly fascinating because it's it's <laughs> it's the type of company you root for, right? Small, made in the garage. And it's, it's like Canadian. These engineers are still there. Even when they grow big, they got the same engineers still there. I'm here. I and, just hear great things about this movie. And it's one of those things where it's like, you can, you can just see how quick a company can get destroyed because they watch the iPhone and they're like, no one wants that shit. People love keyboard. Like that was their point. And to be fair, Microsoft said the same thing. Microsoft was like, you can't, what are you going to send an email with the touchscreen? What are you going to do? Like, like, like hearing so that now just, sound, um, sounds insane, yeah. bro. It was true. If you meant business, if you like, in my head, a person with a BlackBerry was someone who made it and was about their business. Standing yeah. on business, you had a BlackBerry. And yeah, Obama like famously refused to give away his BlackBerry. Yep. When he became a pre- president, and it was one of those things where in this movie they show it's it's honestly pretty fascinating. They show the negotiations with like Verizon and AT and T. That's awesome. Do you know how much it costs to send a text message? 10 cents. Right, but these texts are sent via data. Which means? Unlimited free texting. Only on BlackBerry. Fuck yes. Because essentially what what happens is like Verizon's like, yeah, we'll commit to buying 300,000 of these phones and promote them and sell them. But you have to do this, this, and this. And yeah, so um, BlackBerry is on there. John Wick 4. Is your number one in that of fall? Yes. Okay. Okay. Talk about it because that was uh, my number nine. And let's talk about that right now. Before we talk about Anatomy of the Fall, I just want to really go down this list because I am I am over here telling you guys these are the best movies of 2023. And I just want to make sure you guys know the movies I haven't seen. So there is a need to watch list that I have over here, which made me feel kind of shitty about the movies I haven't watched that I've been hearing good things about. And starting with, it was Blackberry. Everyone's saying Emma Stone and poor things is doing fantastic i haven't seen the holdovers have you seen asteroid city i was just looking at your letterbox and you had the budapest hotel did you see asteroid city 
No, I've seen French Dispatch. I haven't seen Astro City yet. Okay, okay. So American Fiction. These two, I don't feel as bad because they came out like yesterday. Wonka and the Color Purple, and then The Zone of Interest. I haven't seen Napoleon, but you said you've mentioned Napoleon a couple of times. Is it worth the watch? Did I miss it when I didn't go see it in theater? Napoleon, um, if you're expecting a Ridley Scott epic, you're going to get half. He seems okay. fascinated with Napoleon's fascination with his wife. If you look down, you'll see a surprise. Once you see it, you will always want it. Feels like an Arby's night. I don't know if that was the right choice because Napoleon, percentage-wise, is one of the most brilliant commanders and generals in military history. Yes. And, and it's one of those things where, because of how they frame it, he's losing for a bit. But the rise is so crazy and improbable, they kind of just yada, yada, yada through it a little bit. But... I will say the best scene in theaters this year is, a, I think it's the Battle of Austerlitz. It's a winter battle with Napoleon. And it's something that only Ridley Scott could do. You know, battle with horses, winter camp, on ice, cannons firing, and you feel like you're there. And you feel the panic. Amazing moment. And you're like, oh, fucking, I'm so glad. Where this guy made this movie. And then the rest of the movie, you're like, God, this fucking guy. I will say this. There's a movie I saw really early in this year. It technically, I think it came out. It came out in Europe in 2022, but it didn't come out in, in America until 2023. It's called Cairo Conspiracy. It's about a boy in Egypt that goes to the, the university in Cairo to learn to become, I think it's an imam. And... And it's about the political situation in Egypt. Like those guys have a lot of political power. I'm confused. Wait, Mumbari, what are you talking about? Is this your number one? What are you talking no, about? No, 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 no. I'm just talking about, we're talking about. Um, Need no, to watch movie. We, no, we're talking about. Um, Napoleon? I feel like you just switched on me no. and I'm like. Oh, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. I was yeah. talking about a movie I missed in my... Uh, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Movies of 2020. Gotcha, gotcha. Cairo Conspiracy. If you want to watch an indie movie from uh, outside the country, Cairo Conspiracy is it. Political thriller from Egypt. Gotcha. It's really well done. You, you guys, I just found out today that Mumbari had like a legit filled out, like dedicated letterbox. And I'm going to start linking that into all of our videos and podcasts so you can keep up with him, which most likely will be the movies I am also watching. Definitely go check it out. Um, The last movie I wanted to ask before I talk about Anatomy of the Fall is uh, I've been hearing good things about Iron Claw. Do you have any interest? Did you see it? Um, I... I don't watch wrestling. I don't understand. I don't like wrestling. Shut up, bitch. I think I will probably watch it at some point, but it's not a... Uh... It's Marcy. not on your list. Yeah. It, it, it reminds me, remember that movie Margot Robbie did about that chick who broke the other ice skating chick's leg? No, that's a, not a bad it, movie. The that's Tanya Harding it movie? Was a, yeah, that Tanya Harding movie was fantastic. I had a really good time. So that's why I was a little interested, right? I don't watch ice skating, but that was an event. That was like a story. But anyways, let's get into my number one pick of 2023. I don't know if this is a rec uh, like a recent bias that I have, but Mumbari, I can't tell you. Like uh, in my living room, like there's like a couch and then there's like, like a cushion and then there's like a mat, right? Throughout this movie, it is most, not, I'd say like 50% of it is in French, half of it's in English. I'm getting closer to the TV. The tension in my body is rising and rising and rising. And at the end of the movie, it's like Again, like past lives, right? You look at a relationship. It doesn't, and it's not a simple movie. It's a courtroom drama about this lady that people think killed her husband. I'm not a monster. It doesn't, I'm um, spoiler alert, which it isn't a spoiler. They don't give you an answer. These obviously a result to the courtroom drama, but they don't give you an answer as to what happened. And oh my God, I haven't stopped thinking about that movie since. If you've been in any kind of, I don't, I want to say relationship that was heated or you guys weren't like a match made in heaven, any relationship you've had, even with a sibling, even with a friend that you, shit got wild, right? If you recorded a moment in time where you and your friend didn't agree, you and your partner didn't agree, and you guys were yelling and saying some fucked up shit to each other, and you brought that into court, the depths in which they got into this woman's life felt so raw. That's why there's an investigation for a more suspicious death. Because you were the only person there. And of course, you're his wife. Mumbari, 
for someone who likes courtroom dramas, I can't. This movie is in France. Their judicial system is different. I am telling you, I learned more about the, the judicial system through this movie than any other courtroom movie I've ever seen. But it's also, maybe that is the way they do. Is it France? Am I, am I right? Yeah, it's France. And they, yeah. they're famously one of the few countries that doesn't have, what is it, burden of proof. So you have to prove that you're not guilty. Well, oh, shit. Like, like, do you know, like America, you have to prove, prove that the person like, without did a, without, uh, without a yeah. shadow of doubt. Or what yeah. do you think? They had, there's a very specific phrase that they use in the Mer in American court system, and a lot of court systems use that, where you have to be you have to be sure, yeah, before you condemn someone. France doesn't have that. Yeah. That's why that court system is so like crazy because essentially you, you could just say whatever the fuck. <laughs> and honestly, that movie. I, I love that movie because the first time you watch it, you're like, you're like, all right, yeah, it's a courtroom drama wife. Second time you watch it, you're like, whoa, the, the kid is kind of the main character. Yeah. He kind of goes from leaving every time the wife and the husband fight to actively having to be like confront yep. what's going on in his life. I think fabricate a story about the dad to get his mom free. Off. So that's what uh, I was going to ask you. So you that's what you think happened. Yeah, Taz doesn't believe it. Taz believes that that was what actually the dad told him and he just didn't remember. But I was like, this kid, this kid's a smart kid. He would have remembered that earlier. No, I Taz just is, think the reason Taz is right is because the dog knows. And the last scene is the mom and the dog hugging each other. The dog knows. My mom tells yeah. me this all the time. The, the, but that's the, what I'm the, saying. The kid is right then. The, the kid. No, I, I'm, I'm with. I believe Taz. You think that the kid made it up. I don't think the kid made it up. Oh, no. I think the kid made it up and the dad took up. Oh. Oh, you see, ladies and gentlemen, there's layers to this fucking movie. Yeah. Oh, I thought I you think, meant the kid I think made, the it, kid up made, made it up. I think the kid <laughs> realized like what being an adult is. Yeah, exactly. And that like, he's going to have to step up and like figure some shit out. There's a scene where, where they just show the courtroom audience and everyone is just talking and chit chat what to stuff. And then you realize like that's the movie and that's what you're supposed to be doing because yeah. that's what happened after you finish the movie first and the whole time during while you watch this movie at home you're like talking and you're like did she do this did she do that wow that's super weird wow that relationship is super and it's like yeah human fascination with peering and opening into someone's life no, no matter how dull or boring or interesting it is we're all just sucked drawn in. to that we're sucked in yes and the kid realizing that yeah and being like this this jury, this judge just needs a story that they can go home with and say to themselves at night and say, that sounds plausible. Because in the beginning of the movie, her own lawyer walks up to the window, takes a look, and is like, this window still is too high. No one's going to believe this shit. Yeah. And she tells, he tells her, it's not about what you think happened. It's not even about what you can prove. It's like, it's like, and that's, that's. It's that's so, it's so well done because they don't hold any punches. This is a movie where I feel like this is the most real version of this. That's why I'm telling you, I felt like I learned so much about the court system. People think, oh, you know, you just, you go through the, the steps. You say, I'm not innocent. Someone comes up with the big speech at the end that everyone, you know. There is a big speech at the end, but the process in which it took to get to that point, oh my God. Last thing, then we can move over. The, the state lawyer is so fucking good. He's such a good, like, asshole lawyer. Yeah, so that good. Nit he nitpicks everything in the most And he's usually 90, 99% right. That's the thing. He's good, bro. He's so good. I love movies that make the opposition as, as, as strong as humanly possible because that's what the movie was up until the kid made that decision i'm like this bitch is gonna rot in jail so like it was it's just such a good movie and i was thinking about it the entire time and it was such a simple premise but the depth in which it digged into these people's li these characters lives just made me feel so much i love anatomy of the fall you guys have to watch it it didn't blow up as i think it should have but what a good movie I don't know, you, you, you come here, okay, with your, maybe your opinion, and you tell me Samuel was and what we were going through. But what you say is just uh, a little part of the whole situation. What a but great It's just movie. the choices made are so good. Like, like even the fact, the way they, they pr produce the evidence so that you, you're like, you start out 
on the wife's side. Yep. She does dumb shit in the beginning, exactly. like yeah. lie about like a bruise. A bruise that, that like, she has. You're like, no one's going to believe that. Yeah. You and then up. like all this stuff. And then when it actually comes out in court, you're like, all right. And then when you find out she's abusive and all this, all this stuff, you're like, yeah, you're, you're like, like, maybe she is kind of a douchebag. Yeah. And then she starts like flirting with her lawyer. And it like, they make her seem really bad, but in a real way, like, a like how real people do things, like how right. life actually happens. Right. So I just, I, I've been thinking about it so, so, so much and I've had such a good time and it was so intriguing and I was so absorbed. And I feel like that is what a movie is supposed to be. That's why I have it as my number one. Talk to me about yours. Um, my number one is the movie that's probably going to win an Oscar yep. for almost everything. It's definitely going to win. It's probably going to win Best Picture. Definitely going to win Best Actor. Probably going to win Best Supporting Actor. Probably going to win Best Director. Probably going to win Best Score. It's Oppenheimer. It's a type of movie that uh, you feel like only Christopher Nolan can make. Because the, the subject matter is so important, but so also so boring. We're in a race against the Nazis. I know what it means. There's so many characters that are involved in this story. You feel like if anyone else told it, you'd be super confused. I mean, it's something only Nolan can do because this movie, it's like the whole time you're watching the movie, there's like famous actor, famous actor, famous actor. But there's certain characters where you watch and you're like, you're like, all right, am I supposed to know who this person is? It's always like best picture winner, Casey Affleck. Yeah. All right, like that dude's coming back. Best picture winner, Gary Oldman. Yeah, that's Harry Truman. Best picture winner, Rami Malek. He's going to show up for five minutes, be disgruntled, and then show up five minutes an hour later, and you're going to be like, I remember who that is because because that that is someone incredibly famous that is willing to work for 10 minutes for Christopher Nolan. That's just the type of movie we're in. Cillian Murphy kills it. The framing feels weird the first time because it doesn't feel like a traditional biopic because yeah. you're literally like, why is Robert Downey Jr. have this much screen time? Who is this dude? But then when you realize what yep. what's going on, then you're like, all right. Honestly, this movie is not, it's not about Oppenheimer. It's about why we need a movie about Oppenheimer. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. Yes. It's about why we don't know who this fucking guy is. It's about why in 2023, when I'm learning about Oppenheimer, I'm like, how come like every person in school didn't know who this poor guy is? This guy should be as him as Albert Einstein. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, it's because this guy literally tarnished his legacy, ripped his security clearance apart, like made him a communist sympathizer. And that, which he might've been, but, but it's about how his reputation was literally tarnished. Amazing movie. I think it's, I think it's rightfully going to win all the Oscars. The cast is insane. It's insane. Um, and just going back to like seeing all of these superstars come in to just do the little job that is asked, but do it as great as they can and giving it its all. I can't say this enough, you guys. I, watching this movie, and I, I do want to question you about this movie versus Killers of the Fire Moon, but, you know, there's always these side characters and you can tell when they're giving it their all. Emily Blunt as a shitty fucking drunk wife who ends up handing her kids over because she thinks Oppenheimer's uh, goal is much more important than being a parent. She plays a shitty mom so well. Yeah. She plays this like, like that's what I remember about this movie. The minute you see someone and you're like, oh, maybe this is yeah, you, do, you don't remember Florence, Florence Pugh in the meeting room. <laughs> oh, forget about it. Do I not remember Florence Pugh? <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. And then, like, that's a I, matter I, of national security. Yeah, I, I can't and, comment. And I can't tell you enough. I think, um, outside of Chris Pratt right now, but Chris Pratt is like main character status situation. I think Matt Damon might have the best agent in the history of the fucking world because everything he touches is either fantastic or is just like an underrated gem that you love to see. He's in just greatness and he does such good things in this movie. It's not and even, it's, it's honestly not even that because Matt Damon is like the only A lister that's willing to just be like a B list guy b b side for 30 minutes in the movie yes the movie's good enough exactly. and that's something that like brad pitt won't do yeah the leo won't do leo's never gonna be like he's not gonna never side guy yeah. in a in a nolan movie if you offer neil leo a part it's the lead like matt damon has stickers in his lock but he's also the type of guy that'll be like oh yeah i'll show up at the end of interstellar 
as a as as a scientist for half an hour and freak the fuck out. Who's the bad and, guy? Right. Right. Like, and, exactly. And, and he'll do that because he's Matt Damon. He that's like honestly a superpower because yeah, he's a he's a lead actor, but he's willing to do do anything. Do anything but, uh, if the movie is worth it. Right. I need to ask you, Mumbury, because you said looking at your watch watching Killers of the Flower Moon, but you also just said it, and I heard you with my own two ears that this movie was about the really boring stuff. They were st they were like in, in but here's entire, the thing, the, the entire scenes of this movie, Mumbury, where my eyes glazed over, and I'm like, I don't know the fucking science, right? I can feel the tension in the room, but when they're in that the, the the makeshift place in Utah or wherever the fuck they were, and they were and the scientists were arguing about this is the transistor that we can use, and it, it's a great conversation, and you can see great acting, but none of it means anything to me, right? But that's, that's the beauty of it. Go ahead. It's, the, the beauty of it is so. First off, the score does a lot of work. Yes. And then second off, the, the crazy part is it's like he builds a lot with uh, like the score and the visuals of him cr like creating the, the atomic bomb and everything. But it's also simple stuff. Like when, when they're all at the team at, um, in New Mexico and he just has a bowl. That's empty in the beginning, and they and slowly they, start yeah, filling it up yeah. as they go on. And you're like, great visual cue. Even if I don't understand the exact science, I can tell they're getting somewhere yep. with all this stuff. But when he's traveling to each and every person trying to get in this, or he's describing who these guys are in Germany, in the Netherlands, that are geniuses, and he's talking about their relationship with the atom or even when he's talking with Einstein and he's like and you really just get a sense of like reverence and and attention to detail from Nolan when I watched that movie the first time I was like I need to watch this movie probably one or two more times 100% just to just to just like, it in. get it all in and I'm comparing it to Killers of the Flower Moon for obvious reasons right but the explosion of the house and Killers of the Flower Moon versus the actual atomic bomb going off Tell me the house was better. The house was just better, right? The explosion was just better. I just, it just was. But in that scene, right, the bomb, because what you said in the beginning when describing this movie is super important. It's not about the atomic bomb. And it's not even about Oppenheimer. It's about why we need to know or Oppenheimer, right? And right. that scene, his reaction to the bomb is what matters. Cillian Murphy, I don't know, like people do say like, the book, when the book came out about his life, like he's like, now I am the creator of death or whatever. He he said, I have the power of death, yeah. right? Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Like, I don't know if he actually did that at the time that he did that, but the way it played in the movie, you can feel it in your bone. The, the, the scene that he had the imagination of what the world would look like if we had a nuclear war, that scene, that scene was epic. I thought that was beautifully done. And the fact that um, uh, Christopher Nolan did not use a single shot of a single minute of CGI throughout this movie, he does deserve all the credit in the world for that. Yeah, honestly, the way they did the atomic bomb drop and everyone, they, everyone gets all lubed up. <laughs> and you're like you're honestly like on tenor hooks and in the theater it just blows you away yeah uh yeah everything about this is so well done robert downey jr's acting as strauss is so good yeah he's gonna win an oscar silly murphy's gonna win an oscar yeah i don't know what, the, what else to say this is the i think this is the best made movie of the year I think it's a movie that only one or two directors in the world can make mm -hmm. i think uh <sighs> Yeah, I don't think there's much else to say. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the, our list for uh, the best movies of 2023. We talked a whole bunch about a whole a lot of movies. These are the the classics we think will be millennial classics five, ten years from now. Hopefully, we return to these movies in the comment section below. Please let us know what you guys think. But until next time, deuces. deuces.